the first time that I was really sure of my path, my rebel path, was when I saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show. I was 10 years old, I was in the fifth grade, and then after that, the British invasion, the whole thing started, and the Rolling Stones were the next thing that I saw in Ed Sullivan, and that sort of did it right there. It sealed my fate. I knew right then and there that I had found my people, that that was my music, that was my tribe, and um, I felt, I, I think I even knew at 10, that I was somehow, I was somehow gonna be involved in that world. I, I just knew it. It was just an instinct. I became kind of um, obsessed with records, and, and back then you bought records. Um, the radio was cool, the radio, had music. It wasn't really a genre thing. You could hear Alice Cooper, the Everly Brothers, Patsy Cline. I, it was just a smorgasbord. So it, radio was very cool. It was a very different time. And radio went more for good songs than genre. Now everything is separated and there's a genre for everything and a demographic. Back then, a good song was a good song. Uh, demographics didn't exist. Uh, babies liked the same songs that grandmothers liked, and that's how good the songs were. When you heard Roy Orbison on the radio, it was, um, you know, it was a religious experience. Not very many people could could deliver a song like "Crying," so that that was just it. You, you I, beca I became obsessed with music very young, and then I was in Catholic school, Catholic boarding school, and uh, in the eighth grade, I had the nuns let me do a petition to uh, watch the monkeys. So I was obsessed with the monkeys, the TV show, all of it. And the nuns actually gave in and they, uh, they, they let us watch the monkeys uh, in our dorm on Sunday nights. And it, was, it, it went beyond that. It, it seemed like um, music was my language. It was how I communicated. It was how I healed. It was how I got angry. It was how I fell in love. Whatever my feelings were, there was music that went along with it. It was sort of the, uh, I guess you would call it, the soundtrack to my life. And at a very young age, right when I graduated from high school, my mother sent my high school graduation picture to Eileen Ford, who was the biggest agent in the world at the time in New York City. And um, she replied within three days. So the whole thing took place in a series of like, a week to 10 days from my mother sending to the picture and me being on an airplane to New York City to um, be signed to Ford Models. And that was when I was uh, just 18, 1972. And um, I quickly discovered a place called Max's Kansas City. And that was through a series of introductions and I began to date Todd Rundgren after I had been in New York about three or four months. And we, quick, we quickly became one of the triangle of rock royalty. I think it was Mick and Bianca, Angie and David, and Todd and BB, Cindy and Alice. There was a, a big thing about rock couples at that time. And uh, it was a time in history, it was a time in rock and roll that I'm not sure we're, we're ever gonna see again. I don't think we're ever gonna see an artist like Jimi Hendrix again. And if we do, I, I, I hope uh, I'm alive to see it. But there was something going on. There was something in the universe between 1948 and the early 50s when a lot of these people were born. Well, I, I would say starting in 40, 1943 to about 1955. That whole group of people born in that time. I don't think we're ever gonna have those kind of musicians again. I don't think it's gonna be duplicated. I don't think it's possible for it to be duplicated, to be honest. So we were able to live through a time that if I look back on my life, some people say, oh, I wish I was younger or I wish I was 20 again. And I say I would not trade anything for the world. I feel privileged to have been alive when David Bowie walked into Texas to witness that with my own eyes. His beautiful blue suit and his red hair and the, the, the image that he struck, it was alien-esque and otherworldly, and it made everybody in the back room of Max's, not that 
it was very big back there. It was a very intimate, small room. It made everybody gasp. We all went, oh, just like in the movies. Um, and it just, it, it just continued from there. I started singing when I was in uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade in the, in the school choir, the church choir, like I said, Catholic education. And I was a contra alto. I was the only alto in my school, let alone class. So I had a unique voice from a very young age. And I also introduced a tambourine into the church band, um, the nuns. I asked if I could play tambourine because Mick Jagger played tambourine and I asked my mother to get me one. So I started playing tambourine and I was pretty good at it. And it was a fantasy. It was just, I think how it starts for all of us that are musicians, all of us that are singers, front people, however long it takes to get to where you're going to be, you, you sort of know very early. And when I first went to New York, the modeling and the dating such exceptional men, etc., sort of got me off my path of destiny. So I didn't really form my first band or go into the recording studio or do any of that until like 1979, 1980. So, and it was Rick Ocasek from The Cars who took me into the studio and who said, look, the longer you wait on this, the more modeling you do and the longer you wait, it's gonna be harder to make the transition. I, you know, I, I really feel you should get to work now. And, and it was really a godsend. He's one of the best friends I've ever had. And ironically, his wife, Paulina Poroskova, took some of the first pictures of Liv that launched her career, and Bob Gruen as well. So we have sort of a, a rock and roll family, a rock and roll DNA, a rock and roll pedigree, whatever you want to call it. So that's when my journey began. And I, I don't think it's really rocket science. I think either you're part of it or you're not. You know your tribe, you know your people, you know, you decide pretty young if you're a rock person or not. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying I don't like folk music or country music because I like all kinds of music. I just like good music. I don't care what kind of music it is, a good song is a good song. And that's what I strive for. My new album, I wanted every song on it to be good. And I wanted it to read like a book. I wanted, you to, I wanted people to want to listen to it from the first song to the last song all the way through. And I hope I've achieved that. Mm -hmm.